My greetings to you, dear friends, and like-minded people who feel the same way I do. I'm addressing independent film producers of the USA and Ireland, who are intimately connected with the culture of Ireland, with my request about your support of my project. The film that we will be making is The Joys of Loving Joys. It's a story of unique love. The fact that all its heroes are real people makes it even more meaningful. I would ask your attention in watching our presentation reel. My name is Katerina Ksenyeva. I'm an actress, co-author and producer of our project. Thank you. Elena followed the Lady Archivist through the aisles, between racks of shelves loaded with folders. There were thousands of them, arranged in alphabetical order. Romanovich, Igor, born 1908, Minsk province. The woman opened the folder and read from the index. There on the first page was Igor's mugshot. That's him! Elena gave a stifled cry. As she rifled through Romanovich's case folder, she came across a typewritten report by a well-wisher. It stated, Mr. Romanovich, known for his fierce antagonism toward the Soviet state, aims to indoctrinate the Soviet citizens with the decadent alien bourgeois morals of the Western world under the pretext of translating the works of the bourgeois English writer Joyce Elena could read no more, her eyes welling with tears, the written text blurring in front of her, running through the streets blindly, with no recollection of taking the commuter train to her village near Moscow. She arrived home. Aunt Elena's here, the nine-year-old Katya shouted when Elena peered in the window. Her mother Irina, who had been cooking something on the veranda, glanced toward the garden only to see Elena thundering into the house and heading right for the bookcase. Then she climbed onto a stool, took a folder labeled Ulysses from the top shelf, and pulled out a bundle of pages. What do you need the manuscript for, asked Irene. What are you planning to do? I plan to burn it, replied Yelena bitterly. What do you mean burn it, Irene responded. What on earth is bothering you? He was arrested because of Joyce, said Yelena, looking at the pages of handwritten text. He was killed because of Joyce, she shouted, throwing the manuscript across the room, pages flying. God, how I hate him, that garrulous Irish pornographer, that haughty snob. Elena said, trampling the manuscript underfoot. Irina was terrified. She dashed to save the manuscript. What are you doing? Come to your senses. She kept telling Elena, picking up the pages from the floor. This was Igor's work, the masterpiece of his whole life. All futile, exclaimed Elena. His was a futile life. Why did he have to spend it on something completely fake? Didn't he have me in his life? Elena burst into tears, covering her face with her hands, falling helpless to the floor. I never liked this Ulysses, she kept sobbing, never understood it, never liked it. Igor would read me bits and pieces praising it, and I would pretend to like it so as not to hurt his feelings. I don't like this kind of literature, I don't need this stream of consciousness. I like Turgenev, Tolstoy, and Chekhov, I don't need revolutions in literature. I hate all kinds of revolutions, so much evil rises to the top, so much human filth. Irena put the pages she had collected on the sofa and sat down on the floor next to Elena, hugging her and stroking her hair. Get a hold of yourself, my dear. You're wrong. He was arrested because of Stalin, not Ulysses. You know that as well as I do. Katya ran to the women and hugged Elena. Aunt Elena, don't cry, she consoled. Mama made some strawberry preserves and she left the skimmings for tea time. Let's have some. All right, Katya, dear said Yelena through her tears. I could indeed do with a cup of tea. Great, said Irena enthusiastically. I'll just put the kettle on. Yelena took a handkerchief out of her pocket and wiped her eyes. Aunt Elena, can I ask you something? Katja asked. Yelena nodded. 
Why did Uncle Igor die because of his joy? Can joy actually kill a person? Alas, my dear, it can, Elena sighed and hugged the child. Just then, the cat sitting near them suddenly rose and stared into the dark doorway in fascination. Elena turned her head and saw Igor. He was standing there, leaning against the doorframe, or rather, hovering, since his feet did not touch the ground and his body rippled slightly like shimmering heat. His face and his eyes were turned toward her. Aunt Elena, what's wrong with you? Asked the frightened girl, watching Elena's eyes grow wide. What are you looking at? Igor was looking right at Elena, and there seemed to be a ghost of a smile on his face. James Joyce could be called a celebrity nowadays. His name has a magical effect, not only on those who value his literary genius, but also those who have never touched his books, due to the sheer mystery of his name, as with Caravaggio or Paganini. Taking all of the above into account, the fascination and title, The Joys of Loving Joyce, provides great potential. However, the motivation for launching this cinematic project was provided by Twin, a book by Elena Verzhblovskaya, rather than Joyce's personality. It's the heartbreaking story of a beautiful and fragile woman's love for Igor Romanovich, a talented translator, a love she carried with her throughout her entire life. It's hard to imagine anyone cold-hearted enough to be indifferent to the story of this woman's countless ordeals, given that her youth and love were spent in the age of Stalin's cruel regime. Our film is a drama that provides the audience with numerous opportunities for empathy, which are all the more convincing given the fact that the script is based on the lives of real people. Sergei Eisenstein, world famous after the release of Battleship Potemkin, returns to Soviet Russia from Paris. He has with him a copy of Ulysses by James Joyce. He believes this novel to be a revolution in literature. Joyce immerses the reader into the inner human mind, expanding the capacities of both literature and cinema. Eisenstein talks about this at an open conference of writers and cinematographers. This is where our protagonists meet for the first time, Elena Verzhblovskaya, a student from a worker's school. Igor is fascinated by Eisenstein's account of the novel, and implores the director to lend him the book so that he might translate it. Although Eisenstein refuses to part with his copy, he allows Igor to come to his apartment for reading sessions. From their first meeting, the insolent fellow with blazing eyes steals Yelena's heart. Being a poet, Igor instantly recognizes in her the archetype of the mysterious fair maiden that inspired a plethora of poets. There is even an uncanny physical resemblance between the two. Their mutual attraction soon develops into selfless love between the twins, as their friends call them. And who would those friends be? Years later, they would be the famed artists of the 1930s. But in their time, they are simply the young poets and musicians who always play jokes on one another. These young people are passionate about everything, love, friendship, and their disputes over literature. They stay true to Mayakovsky's maxim, live, invent, and try. Meanwhile, Joyce, the literary genius, strives to turn the tide of fate and bring wider recognition to his novel Ulysses, which is still banned in many countries. Turning onto La Closerie de Lila, Power saw Joyce near a restaurant. He was saying his goodbyes to a bohemian-looking couple. Once they left, Power approached Joyce and asked, who were they? Some French couple, Joyce said. What did they want? They want to translate my Ulysses. And you gave them your permission? I did. 
But you don't know a thing about them, said Power. How could you just give Ulysses away like that? But I never refuse anyone. You don't, said Power, in shock. That's right, said Joyce with a smile. You see, I know no one will ever manage. It was evening when Igor came out of the apartment block. Elena saw him and jumped up from the garden bench where she had been waiting. Well, she asked. Amazing. Ulysses is a marvel. Every word is a revelation, but it's so damn long. 800 pages. I say, Elena said, so when do you plan to translate it? Eisenstein wrote to a director he knows with the request to send another copy. I'll start translating immediately. I can't wait to start. What's so special about it? You see, my dear, Joyce contains the whole universe. The characters in the film are those selfless enthusiasts who are devoted to culture as their main goal in life. This is what brings together the young Soviet literati enamored with Joyce's work and the Irish author himself, who lives in the relatively peaceful Europe. He has no inkling of the fateful influence he is having on his Russian admirers and translators. Self-sacrificing in his own beliefs, he is like them. The film's protagonists are the Irish writer James Joyce and Yelena Vershplovskaya. They never meet. However, whenever Joyce isn't in shot, we invariably see Yelena. The link between them is Joyce's novel Ulysses. Yelena's husband, Igor Romanovich, is translating the book into Russian. Igor is a true believer in socialism, convinced he's helping to build a new society with all Soviet people. He is convinced that his fellow countrymen need Joyce's revolutionary genius. Romanovich is full of energy, talented and witty. He doesn't have much use for dejection and he's always fun to be around. He makes Yelena laugh even when she comes to visit him in a concentration camp. Romanovich has an alter ego, poet and translator Valentin Stenich, also an admirer of Joyce. He started translating Ulysses even earlier than Igor but stopped, sensing a repressive crackdown was imminent. Unlike Igor, Stenich hates the regime, hiding his dislike behind a persona of a bon viveur and a practical joker. He drinks a lot and is prone to making anti-Soviet remarks while inebriated, which eventually costs him his life. This ironic man made an impression on the artistic bohemians of the 1930s. He was a friend of Merhold and Shostakovich and inspired the latter to compose extravagant pieces that would have been mortally dangerous to publish during the time. Tavarishi realistickuyu muziku pishut narodnie kompozitori a formalistickuyu muziku pishut Antinarodnie kompozitori Narodnie kompozitori Pišok realističiuskoju muziku Patamu tavarši Što javljajas po prirodje realistami Oni ne mogut Ne mogut Ne pisat muziku realističiuskoju Another secondary character is Arthur Power, an Irish writer and a constant companion of Joyce in his European travels. Power is the person who admires and is in awe of Joyce, and at the same time provokes him into extravagant statements and actions. His part is like that of Sancho Panza to Don Quixote or Dr. Watson to Sherlock Holmes. He allows us to see Joyce as an original thinker, an uncompromising iconoclast railing against the indisputable.
The manuscript of the translation of Ulysses is the thread that ties the story together. It is the link between different characters over half a century. We see it published in Russian, standing on display in one of Moscow's central bookstores at the end of the film. There are three layers in the film that reflect three worlds coexisting. The first is the Soviet reality, with its communal apartments, disdain for life's comforts, thirst for knowledge and optimism, fear and anonymous reports, arrests and forced concentration camps. The second world is the bourgeois West, more laid back with its long walks and restaurants, immersed in languid entertainment as the horror of another world war approaches. The third world is the stream of consciousness introduced by Joyce as a new form of narrative. It is the world of spirit that makes any journey in time and space possible. This is the world where those with talent and imagination end up. Joyce himself, as well as Igor Romanovich, Stenich, and Yelena. Here we're confronted with the problem of representing stream of consciousness visually. The authors of the film endeavor to build on the experience of renowned cinematographers and their innovative methods of montage editing. By telling the incredibly touching story of the life and love of Yelena Vyshblovskaya, the film also advertises Joyce's work. If the young people of today develop an interest in the mysterious Irish writer after watching the film, it will have served its purpose. We believe that one of the most important goals any artist should aspire to is to reconnect with the cultural tradition that has been lost and to give today's younger generations an opportunity to discover the world of spiritual values. Thank you for watching. I would like to say a few words about my father, film director and script writer Yuri Manin. It is no wonder that now in the epoch of a new dictatorship of Russian government, guided by Stalinist values, Yuri Mamin is a person non grata in modern Russia. The project The Joys of Love and Joys is claimed to be anti-patriotic and harmful for Russian people. Film director Yuri Mamin is Russia's only winner of Charlie Chaplin's golden cane, handed to him by the widow of the great film satirist. The head of Sony Pictures, Michael Barker, invited Yuri Mamin to be nominated for the Oscar in 1994 with his film The Window to Paris, also known as Salade Russe. In his letter to Russian Minister of Culture, Michael Barker wrote, Dear Sir, we are the distributors of Salade Russe, directed by Yuri Mamin in North America. The response to the film at screenings in Los Angeles and New York has been terrific with both the critics and the audiences. It seems to communicate the message of bringing two cultures together in a warm and enlightening manner. Russia has not won the best foreign language film Academy Award since 1981. Should Salad Rus be the official Russian entry to the Academy Award for the best foreign film, we feel confident the picture will not only be nominated for the award, but has a very good chance to ultimately win the award itself. The only way this is possible is if the film is the official Russian entry. Sony Pictures Classics has been involved with many Academy Award nominees over the years, including the last two years Academy Award winners for Best Foreign Film, France's Indochine in 1992, and Spain's Belle Epoque in 1993. A director like Yuri Maman that has a new voice for American audiences is the type of filmmaker Academy members love to discover. Sony Pictures Classics will support the picture in the manner we have supported our very best films. And I'm sure it will make you, your colleagues, and your country very proud to be involved with another Academy Award nominee, and possibly even a winner. I hope you give Salad Rus your utmost consideration as the official Russian entry. Thank you, Michael Barker. Michael Barker's letter to the Russian Minister of Culture inviting Yuri Mamen to the Oscar Academy Festival caused quite a stir. The Minister of Culture was determined to prevent Yuri Mamen's film from going to the USA. This militant idiocy is typical of the Russian system. 
Yuri Mamin sculpted the first swallow of Gorbachev's perestroika. In 1989, in the Gorbachev epoch, Yuri Mamin was invited to the USA to present his first two films, The Neptune Holiday and The Fountain. It is worth noting that a number of American senators had the films ordered for viewing in order to have an idea of what was going on in Russia at the time. Since the Russian authorities hate Gorbachev and consider him an enemy of the Soviet system, the name Yuri Mamin is hated as much as the name of Gorbachev. I believe that the opinion of the head of the American production company Sony Pictures, Michael Barker, is to be respected. Yuri Mamin's films have attained a great number of world prizes and the love of his audiences. The project The Joys of Loving Joys under Yuri Maimon's direction, promises to become a truly deep and passionate phenomena of the world cinema. Thank you.